Yeah, hi everyone. Thank you for joining today. I'm Katie Lund, Circus Director of Engagement, and I'm joined um, by my colleague, John Truszynski, who is our Director of Resilience Planning to welcome you today. Uh, we're pleased to partner with staff from the state's Division of Emergency Management and Homeland Security, or DEMIS, to host this webinar focusing on FEMA's Hazard Mitigation Assistance Program. Um, CIRCA works closely with DEMIS and other state agencies as part of the state agencies fostering resilience or SAFER, um, and we're happy to provide information like this through that partnership and our Resilient Connecticut project. Um, there are several, um, let me try advancing my slides here. There are um, several important grants that fall under this FEMA um, Hazard Mitigation Assistance Program, and we're glad to have the opportunity to hear um, from the speakers today who are gonna describe the importance of this program for implementing uh, local resilience projects, and importantly, um, some tips for how to apply. Um, you know, this is especially important in the short term as we're hopeful that more federal dollars will be coming available, and it's important to have communities think about resilience projects um, in need of funding to prepare competitive applications moving forward. So we're gonna start actually the webinar by hearing some remarks from Senator Murphy um, because he has some important um, comments related to federal funding and we're gonna hear from him. Um, he continues to be a strong advocate for our state and communities in Connecticut um, to implement projects that address climate change and improve um, local resilience both at a local level and the state level. We'll then move into the um, great lineup of speakers we have. We're gonna hear from Ken um, Dumas and Ian Alexander. They are from Demis and they're both state hazard mitigation officers. They're gonna talk about the hazard mitigation um, process overview and the application process. And then we're gonna transition to hearing from FEMA staff for the second hour. We'll hear first from Sean Service, who's um, gonna talk about FEMA GO's online platform for grants management. He's from FEMA Grants and uh, Analytics Branch. And then we're going to hear from um, John Rudolph and Keisha Isaac Ricketts, who are both from FEMA Region 1. And they're gonna talk about um, the importance of benefit cost analysis and some of the requirements for projects and planning and, and tips for successful preparation for BCA. I'm going to stop sharing my screen because John um, is going to share the Senator Murphy video. And while he's bringing that up, I am going to just talk about a few webinar mechanics. We are recording this event. And so um, we're gonna send it to all registrants uh, afterward. So you can share it with colleagues if you find useful information in this. And then um, we'll also be uh, distributing it through our monthly uh, resilience round of newsletter for others who weren't able to make it, um, who are part of our broader uh, community. Uh, and then we're going to um, be fielding questions. We, we do want to make sure that there's time for questions uh, throughout the event. So you can enter your questions either in the chat. Um, if you can't see your chat bubble, it should be in the lower middle part of your screen. It kind of looks like a cartoon bubble. You can type your question, press enter, and we should be able to see them there. You can also try using the Q&A. Um, and John and I will be monitoring these and fielding questions as best we can um, for each of the speakers as we move forward. So, John, I'm going to let you um, share the Murphy video. We see it great, and um, we can watch this and then transition to our speakers. Thank you. All right, thanks, Katie. Um, I'm gonna play the video. Just let me know if there's any audio issues with it. Hey everybody, it's Chris Murphy, US Senator from Connecticut. Thanks to my friends at Circa and the state for pulling people together to talk about the importance of uh, applying for hazard mitigation grants. This is a real opportunity for towns, for nonprofits in Connecticut. And we wanna make sure that you have all of the information available to you. I really want you to be thinking about being proactive here because uh, I'm the new chairman of the Appropriations Subcommittee on Homeland Security. That's the subcommittee that writes the FEMA grant program. And as we speak right now, uh, I'm prioritizing getting more money into these accounts, more money into disaster mitigation and prevention accounts. And I wanna do it in a way that 
make sure more money comes down to smaller municipalities and government and non-government units. So planning and scoping these projects right now, even if you're not ready to apply today, um, I think is really important because my belief, coming from somebody who's on the inside of this process, is that there's going to be significantly more money available uh, for disaster mitigation and remediation and prevention in Connecticut uh, in the coming years. So again, thanks to the partners who are putting this together. Thanks to all of you for participating. Uh, thanks for putting me in a position as your senator to be able to lead on this conversation as the, the new chairman of the committee overseeing FEMA. Okay, so thank you, John, for sharing that. Um, I am going to transfer um, the presentation over to you, Ian, and uh, we do appreciate Senator Murphy's comments and um, and his remarks to kick off the webinar because it's encouraging. It's really encouraging to hear um, that more support for resilience planning is on the horizon. Um, so now we're going to transition to our first set of speakers. We have both Ian Alexander and Ken Dumas um, here uh, to, to kick it off. I'll turn it over to you. Thanks. All right, hey Ken, take it away. Great. Well, hello there, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining us this afternoon um, after a lunch. And uh, hopefully, we can keep you awake uh, while listening to our presentation. I'm going to um, just uh, pause my video feed and just so we can chat and concentrate on the um, slides here. First, I'd like to thank Senator Murphy and his staff for the support they're providing for the Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities Program and the Hazard Mitigation Assistance Program here in the state of Connecticut and at the national level in his role as the Appropriations Chair. Second, I'd like to thank Katie and John at Circa for hosting uh, this, this presentation and their partnership and resilience here in Connecticut we share with them. I'd like to also thank John Randall and Keisha Isaac Ricketts for presenting the benefit cost analysis tool and to Sean Servos for re reviewing the FEMA Go platform. I'm going to start out our presentation today just doing a quick Demis 101. Uh, we're going to discuss the FEMA hazard mitigation assistance programs. We'll do a quick uh, brick and FMA or building resilient infrastructure communities and flood mitigation assistance recap. A 2021 brick FMA process overview, which will include the sub application process and the sub application sections overview. At the end, we'll provide some time, hopefully, to answer some questions from anyone out there in the audience, and uh, we hope we can uh, cover that well with everyone here today. So, first, a little Demis 101. The Demis Mitigation Unit handles grant administration of three programs under the HMA umbrella. We cover the Hazard Mitigation Assistance Grant Program. Uh, we cover the Flood Mitigation Assistance Grant Program. And we also cover the Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities Grant Program, which was formerly the Pre-Disaster Mitigation Grant Program. Under the Hazard Mitigation Assistance Grant Program administration, we complete application development, technical assistance, outreach, and solicitation, and we cover the awards, project monitoring, reimbursements, quarterlies, and closeouts. Some of our mitigation planning duties include overseeing the development of the state natural hazard mitigation plan. We also oversee development or review of the local jurisdictional um, natural hazard mitigation plans, and we complete the threat hazard identification risk assessment, also known as the Thyra and the SPR. Some other mitigation slash cross functional efforts we do are um, the CERCA program with our resiliency efforts, 
uh, we drive mitigation priorities and we complete grant alignment with other agencies throughout the state. In addition to our mitigation uh, duties, we, we wear other hats here at Dennis. We, under prevention and mitigation, we partner with the Connecticut Intelligence Center or the or CTIC as some refer to. Uh, we have planning and preparedness units here that operate the preparedness grants, uh, which include EMPG and the Homeland Security Grant Program. We complete all hazards development planning. We assist in training and exercise development. Under response, Ian and I wear a couple of hats there also. Ian participates in the, uh, as uh, ESF1 uh, co-chair, I guess, Ian, um, uh, under transportation. Uh, I also do ESF6, which is a mass care coordinator, and the individual assistance program in recovery. We complete work under the state response framework. Demis is the coordination lead for the state agencies across all emergency management phases. We activate and coordinate, or we assist in activate and coordinating operations at the state emergency operations center, both in person and virtual. And in our roles under recovery, we work on the disaster recovery framework. Uh, we assist occasionally with the public assistance programs um, and uh, in completing damage assessment, briefing, declarations, and grant administration. It's a lot, I know, but we just wanted to fill you in a little bit there. So. So the term mitigation gets thrown around a lot uh, in many, many industries. But when we speak in terms of mitigation or hazard mitigation, we at Demis are referring to this definition here, which is hazard mitigation is defined as any sustained action taken to reduce or eliminate long-term risk to people and property from natural hazards and their effects. That's technically the FEMA hazard mitigation assistance definition. Some of the acronyms that, that you'll hear today are listed on the right side of the page here. Uh, we have a tendency to speak in, in acronyms. Uh, forgive us if we do so. Uh, if you have questions about the acronyms that we're using, um, we can certainly answer them at the end and we'll, we will try to do our best to at least get um, the full term out once during our app, during our presentation. Um, so some of the things you'll hear quite a bit here today is BCA, uh, benefit cost analysis. John will be covering some of that information. BCR, which is the benefit cost ratio. That's the ultimate uh, goal to have a positive benefit cost ratio for uh, applications. BRIC, as I stated before, is building resilient infrastructure communities. Circa, Katie defined. Demis is our Division of Emergency Management and Homeland Security. DEEP, Department of Environmental Energy and Environmental Protection. EHP, you'll hear on the FEMA side quite a bit, is Environmental and Historic Preservation. FEMA, Federal Emergency Management Agency. FMA is Flood Mitigation Assistance. FEMA GO or GO, here is FEMA Grants Outcome. HMA, Hazard Mitigation Assistance, and HMGP, is the hazard mitigation grant program. And Ken, and Ken, this is Ian. I'm sure there's more, but uh, they didn't fit on the slide. Yeah, that is correct, Ian. And, uh, you know, as I said, uh, if, if anybody has any questions about our use of acronyms or or, or are, uh, are confused by any of them, please feel free to jot it down and we can do our best to help you there in the end to uh, clarify what we're speaking. So under the FEMA hazard mitigation assistance umbrella, so to speak, or HMA umbrella, we have three programs that we administer, HMGP, BRIC, and FMA. And again, just to, just to clarify, BRIC is formally the PDM program, pre-disaster mitigation, which several 
of the folks on may be familiar with. Um, all of these three programs fall under the 2015 FEMA HMA guidance. So they all will follow a very similar or, or virtually the same guidance. HMGP is disaster dependent, meaning it's it's a state managed and competitive grant. And just a quick overview here is typically 15% of the first 2 billion in the public assistance award. The BRIC program is nationally competitive with a state set aside. Uh, right now that set aside is approximately $600,000. It's an annual program and it replaced, as I said before, the pre-disaster mitigation program in 2020. FMA is also a nationally competitive program. It's an annual program. It's tied to the national flood insurance policies and it reduce, it's, it's targeted to reduce losses to the NFIP or the national insurance policy properties. Uh, just to quickly go over some of the images that you're seeing, uh, the image all the way to the left there is an image of a home that was acquired under the HMGP program in Westport. The center uh, image under brick or the next image under brick is a uh, flood um, detention um, pond that was or a detention way that was completed in Ohio. It was one that that um, that we didn't have here in uh, in, the, in our state, but just wanted to give you some images there. Uh, the next is community and capacity building. Uh, that's a bit new, and we'll talk about that further on down in the in the presentation. And we also have uh, the final image to the right, which is a home elevation, and that is where you know is that I, I think that's maybe. Um, Fairfield or Milford? Yeah, somewhere along the coast, maybe yeah. Milford. Maybe somewhere Fairfield, along but the Connecticut coast there. A, a very typical project that we see in under the FMA program. Next slide, please. So next slide here is we're going to briefly just chat a little bit about some of the eligible mitigation activities and forgive me to read off the slide, but it's kind of my notes to. Um, the eligible mitigation activities is listed in the 2015 HMA guide include all the items uh, to the right there. I won't read through those all individually, but you can see. Um, because this guide was written in 2015 and, and we have since. Uh, created the new brick program you can you can uh, uh, substitute brick for pdm in this in this uh, uh, presentation here so some of the construction mitigation projects that we see uh, typically include culverts drainage projects generators for critical facilities property elevations and acquisitions which is one of our higher level um, activities, uh, dry flood proofing, localized flood redu uh, risk redu uh, reduction, such as seawall upgrades, and mitigation reconstruction. Mitigation reconstruction is not something that FEMA really likes to see, but occasionally we are uh, able to, to work on some of those projects. Uh, this also includes uh, eligible activities, hazard mitigation planning. One thing to note here is that all eligible municipalities, COGS, and the state for that matter, must have an approved active natural hazard mitigation plan. Uh, the only exception to that is if you are putting in a grant to update your natural hazard mitigation plan. We also look at community and capacity building activities, which is a new, a new um, item under the uh, BRIC an FMA program, and all of these uh, projects include um, management costs for each individual grant. So some common act mitigation activities we see in Connecticut are, as I stated before, mitigation plan updates, 
uh, project scoping activities, which is which is relatively new and it's and it's designed to help build quality applications. We look at culverts and drainage projects, generators for critical facilities, and property evaluations or elevations and, and acquisitions. So just to quickly look at a couple of the images here to, to the right, um, we have the Western COG multi-jurisdictional mitigation plan, which was completed under the PDM 2018 cycle of grants. We have the Meriden Harbor Brook flood control project, which was completed under an HMGP project, uh, 4023, which is, I believe, Superstorm. No, it's it's uh, Irene, uh, Irene, I believe. And then we have the, a couple of projects below, which are the uh, under the Greater New Haven Water Pollution Control Authority, um, elevation of generators and protection of generators. Some application or some applicants are required to have a FEMA approved local or tribal mitigation plan in accordance with 44 CFR Part 201 by the application deadline and at the time of the obligation of grant funds for mitigation projects and. <clears throat> um, additional activities with the exception of mitigation planning, community capacity work, excuse me. Next scene. Yeah, thank, thankfully, uh, we don't have to see uh, wildfire mitigation or uh, safe room construction. We mostly see uh, projects like that that deal with flooding. Um, but those are just some of the examples that we've seen. Yeah, and in the state of Connecticut, I, I would say our primary uh, hazard that we mitigate against is is flooding. And when we talk about hurricanes, that includes some some wind damages. But primarily in Connecticut, we look at at, at flooding. We do we do get a lot of uh, tornadoes, uh, believe it or not, in the state of Connecticut. Also, so we, um, we tend to uh, look at wind damage also with tornadoes and hurricanes. So, under the hazard mitigation grant program, it's awarded upon a presidential disaster declaration. So, as I said before, 15% of the total public assistance award is set aside for the hazard mitigation grant program up to the first 2 billion. We've never exceeded that amount before in public assistance. So, uh, and we hope to never exceed that amount. Thank goodness. Yeah. <laughs> um, the application period is typically open for one year from the date of disaster declaration. The projects are chosen and submitted by the state to FEMA through a state ranking process. This process um, works we can talk a little bit about this more after too, but uh, typically works like this. Uh, during the open application period, we receive applications. We compile those applications and determine their eligibility with our interagency hazard mitigation committee, which is comprised of several um, nonprofits and other state agencies. With that IHMC, we, we rank those projects and we submit those projects for review to um, our FEMA Region 1. Eligible sub -applicants, applicants under this program include state and local governments, nonprofit organizations, and Indian tribal nations. The cost share for the HMGP is 75% federal and 25% non federal, or 25% cost match. We currently have an application period open as we speak for HMGP disaster 4580, Tropical Storm Isaias, and that application period closes uh, January 12th of 2022. As we said, that application period is currently open. We are accepting uh, letters of intent uh, for, for projects, um, and we are here to assist anyone who would like to, to um, look deep or further into that uh, application period. So just to quickly go over the diagram to your right, uh, we have a disaster or an emergency uh, that's followed by the presidential disaster declaration, which is completed uh, in-house here um, at Dennis. 
Again, we have an application uh, period that's open for one year following the declaration. We have the notice of sub application intent form. The HMGB sub application submission. We have our FEMA review and request for information or RFI, followed by a FEMA award and DEMIS sub award to the beginning period of performance. And that performance period is typically around a three year period. That's right. And Ken, if I, and we'll, we'll talk about this later, um, but the notice of sub-application intent is a very important piece of um, the, the entire HMA umbrella because it allows DEMIS and other state partners and FEMA to actually determine if a project is eligible or not, rather than having a community go through, submit an entire application, come to find out that the project was never eligible under FEMA guidelines, and then time was spent. Um, so that's why we really harp on the, this new notice of sub application intent and, and we'll talk a little bit more about it. But um, in that diagram, we definitely wanted to, to make you aware of that uh, piece there. Next slide. Ian. Thank you. So the next slide here, we're going to talk about um, the flood mitigation assistance program or FMA program. Again, this uh, program has an emphasis on mitigating NFIP insured properties or national flood insurance program properties. Our annual disaster, it's an annual disaster program. The funds, it funds projects to reduce or eliminate the risk of flood damage to buildings that are insured under the NFIP. For this program, eligible sub application applicants include state and local governments and Indian tribal nations. Cost share for this program varies. We have our severe repetitive loss property mitigation, which is 100% funded. Our repetitive loss property mitigation is a 90 10 uh, cost share. All other projects, eligible projects identified on in the 15 hazard mitigation assistance guidance and notice of funding opportunity are a 75-25 cost share. And one thing to note here too is all projects must be in compliance with Connecticut DEEP regulations and requirements. Some quick examples of eligible FMA projects include localized flood control, property elevation and acquisitions, flood water storage and diversion, floodplain and stream restoration, stormwater management, and wetland restoration creation. The, the important thing to know about flood mitigation assistance is that you have to be protecting uh, future damages from NFIP insured properties. So any of those examples that Ken listed um, have to in some way protect uh, an NFIP insured structure. Um, we work with the wonderful um, Diane Ifkovic, who I'm sure many of you work with, um, to determine you know NFIP status. And uh, uh, we highly recommend if you have severe repetitive loss properties to put in under this program. Next slide. So Ken, I'll um, I'll talk about this slide here. Um, I just wanted to briefly, very briefly, because I know it's a little confusing, talk about how FMA ranks their projects and. The reason is because we, we talk later about how the BRIC program ranks its projects. Um, $200 million was available in 2020. Um, as you can see, 70 million uh, was allocated for community flood mitigation projects. Those are those things that Ken mentioned, the stormwater retention, the, the localized flooding. Um, and in the bottom left, that table there is how FEMA ranks um, those community flood mitigation projects. So. Um, I'm not going to try and add that up because math is not is not my uh, my strong uh, point here, but um, just wanted to show you you know the the priorities that they're seeing. If you're an NFIP policyholder, if you're severe repetitive loss or repetitive loss, if you're community if you're participating in the community rating system, um, you know your 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 graded scale, your your uh, level of of CRS gets you more uh, or less points. Um, so that's how they they rank community flood mitigation projects, and then. Uh, the last 126 million, which is um, from again from 2020, and we're hoping to see more 
um, mentions in there number five, individual flood mitigation projects. Those would be um, private property elevations or acquisitions. Um, and again, those are uh, prioritized based on the property status, severe repetitive loss, repetitive loss, or um, this SLR, uh, SRLB, which um, I'll let, uh, if anybody has any questions, we can get you the definition. Um, but it deals lots with numbers and damages to it. But so just wanted to have this uh, slide in there for awareness for how um, FEMA ranks FMA projects, because they're a little different um, in terms of it, whether it's a community flood mitigation project or if it's um, any of those on the right, technical assistance planning or individual flood mitigation projects. So, um, and those are the priorities one, two uh, through five. So. Go ahead with uh, the brick program, Ken, because that's uh, the bell of the ball nowadays um, with, the, with the amount of money that uh, FEMA's thrown into that program. Yes, uh, Ian's right. Yeah, and it, it sounds like we're going to be uh, looking at probably double what we had for last year. And again, not to not to overstate this, but it, um, it's it's nice to have uh, uh, Senator Murphy so involved in in this process and and have him there to. Uh, to uh, you know, seek out uh, information from. Um, and we've been fortunate enough to to partner with him on several occasions uh, in uh, doing community outreach program with with him. So uh, you know, thank you again to he and his staff for uh, for allowing us to participate in that uh, program. But uh, the brick the brick program uh, provides federal funds to states, territories, tribal governments, and local communities for pre-disaster mitigation activities. Eligible sub-applicants sub under this program include state local governments, Indian tribal nations, and nonprofit organizations. Some of the differences from PDM or pre-disaster mitigation to the BRIC program include a focus on the community lifelines and infrastructure projects. To the right there, you'll see the community lifelines, FEMA's community lifelines. These are used um, not only in this program, but in, in several of the other uh, programs that FEMA is now administering. Uh, these include safety and security, food, water, and shelter, health and medical, energy, communications, transportation, and hazardous material. Uh, the focus in community lifelines, again, is, is, uh, is high on the um, project or priority list of, of the BRIC program. Uh, this encourages building code projects, or they encouraging FEMA is encouraging building code projects, uh, an emphasis on mutual and shared responsibility and partnerships, and they are looking at innovative approaches, including nature-based solutions. We we saw many of these types of projects come in under the 2020 uh, brick round, and uh, Ian will discuss further on in the uh, in the presentation what we saw under the 2020 program and, and how some of those projects were funded on the national level. Uh, one, one item of note here, under the BRIC program, to be eligible, the state must have received a ma major disaster declaration under the Stafford Act in the last seven years. The annual grant application period, or within seven years of the annual grant application period, Fortunately, in the state of Connecticut, this hasn't been a problem for us, and I guess unfortunately at the same time. Ian? So um, moving forward into uh, more about the BRIC, as Ken mentioned, there's it seems like there's going to be a lot more funding uh, put towards it. Um, right now, it's funded by a 6% earmark um, from post-disaster funding. So the money that goes into, you know, response, Hurricane Sandy, um, Hurricane Irma, that, that money, they're actually setting 6% of it aside uh, for post-disaster grant funding under BRIC. Um, it's been floated around in that infrastructure bill that President Biden might try to inject more money into it. And, and Ken and I are, are fairly confident that this is probably, BRIC program is probably where it would go. Um, the funding pots, um, Ken mentioned the state and territory all allocation, that's 600,000. We're hoping to see it go more. There's a tribal set aside and then the national competition. So um, there's a breakdown of how much of that, I think it was 500 million last year, uh, of how much goes into each one of those. So um, 
project types, like Ken said before, eligible activities under the 2015 guide, and then they've expanded it to include uh, capability and capacity building, which um, we have a slide to talk about that in a bit. Um, cost share 7525, much like HMGP, and um, small and impoverished communities can actually get an increased cost share. So um, I know in our initial analysis of the 2020 grants, there were a, a, of what was selected for BRIC, I think a few um, small and impoverished communities uh, nationally chosen. So, Ken, do you want to talk about the um, eligible activities and um, well, we kind of already covered that, but the right there on the right hand side, what these projects must be. Sure, sure. Thanks, Ian. Um, so we wanted to briefly talk about some of the eligible activities under BRIC and, and really kind of focus on the project musts, uh, the must haves for these projects. So, so we have our standard uh, existing activities that we, we've talked about a little bit. We've had, and now we have our expanded eligibility projects, which include uh, project scoping, building code activities, pre-award costs, additional activities for wildfire wind implementation and or earthquake warning uh, solutions. Uh, just quickly to talk about the pre-award costs, they're directly related to developing the BRIC grant application or sub-application. Applicants and sub-applicants who are not granted awards or sub-awards will not receive reimbursement for the corresponding pre-award costs. Pre-award costs are incurred prior to the date of the award. There, are no, there is no start date for when they can be incurred. They can be incurred any time during, any time prior to the award. So, again, to highlight the one thing on this slide that I, I feel like um, is, is are the must-haves. First off, a project must be cost-effective. And, and we have John on today to talk a little bit about the BCA-BCR process. Uh, when we say cost-effective, the, the project must have a benefit cost ratio greater than 1.0. And simply stated, that means that the benefits must outweigh the costs of producing that project, of, of, of completing that project. Project must reduce or eliminate risk and damage from natural hazards. It must meet the latest two consensus building codes under 15 and 18. Um, in many cases, too, we have um, directives from deep for many of our um, um, elevations, uh, uh, elevation type projects. Uh, the project must align with um, the, the state and, and local natural hazard mitigation plans. And they must also meet all the environmental and historic preservation requirements. So we've talked a lot about um, what's eligible under BRIC, and it would seem like a lot, um, but taken right from the 2015 HMA guide, well, probably I'm not going to read all of these, um, but anything that 2015 HMA guide says is that ineligible under uh, PDM is also ineligible under BRIC. Um, projects that are dependent on one action to uh, be effective. So that's that's um, if you're phasing projects. So in order for uh, phase one to be completed, phase two has to start. Things like that. That's not eligible. Um, deferred maintenance or repair or replacement, things like that. FEMA uh, looks at those as capital improvement. So again, ineligible. Um, preparedness measures and response. That type of stuff is funded under Homeland Security or Emergency Management Program grants, um, not funded under uh, uh, hazard mitigation grants. And then things that um, the the high the highest priority one is project for actual physical work has already started. Um, that is a, a big uh, no go um, for FEMA projects. If if you've already started a, an infrastructure project and you're looking for funding, it's it's a moot point right right off the uh, the jump. But um, then there are some other things there, you know, that include hazardous waste and environmental considerations. But those things ineligible, big X mark. Um, Ken mentioned a ton of things that are eligible, but we we wanted to have in the slide the things that uh, that are ineligible, and these are all referenced in the 2015 HMA guide. Um, in case uh, now you can't see because of the big X on your screen. Um, but so uh, we also talked a lot about capability and capacity building. Um, this is directly from from FEMA. It's a it's a new um, 
activity and it includes these four sub activities including building codes partnerships project scoping and planning um, basically the the de definition is their activities that enhance the knowledge skills and expertise of the workforce um, the, think of these as all non uh, breaking ground or non shovel projects um, obviously mitigation planning project scoping is things like engineering and designing um, the problem with the uh, these C and C B activities is that they can actually only be submitted under the state set aside. Um, that is uh, low right now, and, and we're hoping that that can uh, be raised a little bit um, because of the cost, you know, project scoping and and actually mitigation planning um, is actually capped at, at last year. It was capped at three hundred thousand, um, and we'll talk about that in the in the next slides. Um, but so. Under the national competition for BRIC, we just wanted to provide this this slide. We're not ex exactly sure if this is how they'll do the 2021 rankings, um, but these are just considerations that we wanted you to have um, for where the the points are being weighted. Um, as you can see, mandatory building code uh, adoption. I believe I'm not I'm not the building code expert of the state, but I believe the state adopts the, the building codes and local jurisdictions either adopt the state or go higher. Um, so, so we're all good there, but, um, if you can see, you know, 5 points for increased non federal cost share. Um, right now it's 75, 25. If you do 70, 30, you could get 5 more points. Um, if you include na nature based solutions, that's an additional 10 points. Um, still a new thing that, uh, you know, we're figuring out, um, but that green infrastructure piece. So, um, the lifelines are mentioned there, one or more. So these are just what FEMA is looking at for the points for how they rank the national projects under the national competition. So um, moving to 2020, which was the first year of BRIC, um, that that graphic there is the entire country. And if you see Connecticut, we we actually submitted over $151 million in, in sub applications. So we did pretty well for ourselves. Um, kudos to everyone, a lot of people on this call. We had 26 sub applications uh, mitigating 52 structures, but the 2020 brick season was a learning curve for a lot of people. Um, it replaced the pre disaster mitigation program. Um, now, everything was eligible and more, so we were used to what was eligible, but that state set aside um, was 600,000 and there was funding caps on mitigation planning and uh, all other eligible activities. So typically. We, you would actually be able to fund small projects under your state set aside, but because of those planning caps and because of the new capability and capacity building, which everyone was so excited about, um, we weren't able to fund any uh, uh, shovel ready projects under the state set aside, just uh, community capacity building and, and mitigation planning. Um, last year was the first year we rolled out the notice of sub application intent and, and personally, I think it was really helpful, um, not only to the state, but also to our partners. Um, our, uh, local jurisdictions or sub applicants would submit notice of intents to the state and we would review them um, to give you that no go, no, uh, no go milestone of um, whether it was eligible or not. Um, and I think that helped a lot of communities. We also provided some technical assistance, you know, things to consider while you're developing your application. Um, did we also mention that while FEMA was rolling out a brand new program, they also rolled out a brand new uh, grants portal, uh, FEMA Go. And so learning um, the hurdles of that program or uh, that that portal um, was something that we that we we worked through. Uh, it's a good portal, um, you know, as as all new things can be tweaked here and there. But uh, that was also fun to learn about uh, while we were doing Brick 2020. Um, as always, we, we really harp on the benefit cost analysis and having backup data. We saw that with a lot of our projects. Um, the state issues of an RFI to local jurisdiction, their local sub applicants. And um, a lot of it was, you know, your BCA is low. We need to get it higher. We need to have some backup documentation. And then the last thing to consider is that um, the management and administration cost share is actually 100% under BRIC. Um, that's activities that are funded. Uh, for you to actually manage your grant, salaries, supplies, um, personnel. So the fact that FEMA bumped that to 100% and there's no cost share for it, I think is actually a really a good component of the BRIC program. Um, just really briefly, the Connecticut state set aside where, where uh, six projects were identified for further review. They were all planning and capacity building. And under the national competition, if you submitted a project uh, that went to the national competition, don't don't feel bad because there were over 900 submitted and only 22 projects were chosen. Um, 
I think in 10 or 11 states. So um, in our brief analysis, and we're working with FEMA to get a, a little bit more in depth in our brief analysis, these projects were massive projects, really big um, resilient efforts as it states in that bullet, five states submitted projects over $200 million in federal share. Um, that's a lot of money in the federal share. And uh, so that's what it looks like. The BRIC program is kind of moving to these big multi-jurisdiction, big regional uh, mitigation projects. So now we're into the 2021 grant season, and that's why Ken and I are um, partnering with Circa and other partners to, uh, you know, kind of do these outreach sessions so we can kind of get the ball rolling. Senator Murphy said so, so I guess we have to uh, take his word and go for it. Um, but some er some dates, these are preliminary. Um, the federal notice of funding opportunity will probably come out around early fall. Uh, last year, I think it came out September 30th. So we're anticipating that maybe a little sooner. We've heard some rumblings that FEMA is going to release it a little earlier. The notice of intent deadline, again, that's not required, the notice of intent, but we have felt that uh, it provides sub applicants with um, a good uh, test of the waters to determine if a project's eligible. Last year, we made that around the middle to the end of October, because um, that way um, the state kind of has an idea of what projects we can expect. Um, then FEMA GO application deadline, the initial sub application has to be into FEMA GO um, by the end of November. Ken and I and, and Demis try to give as much time as we can um, to get uh, partners and sub applicants their projects in. Because we know it, it can take a little while to, to wrangle the cats and get applications developed. Then uh, basically from the end of November to maybe the first week in January, there's a state review and RFI process. We look at we partner with the Interagency Housing Mitigation Committee. We look at all of the projects. Uh, we issue RFIs. And then at the end of the, when the applications are due to FEMA, the state takes all the sub applications and put them together into one uh, state application. And then we just wait. Uh, FEMA just announced its uh, BRIC 2020 application statuses um, uh, like two weeks ago. So there is a, uh, there's a little bit of a waiting period, but we just wanted to make everyone aware of that timeline. Um, so I'm going to run really quick because for the interest of time, we want to offer some questions. Um, these are the HMA sub application sections that you're going to see, whether it's on an HMGP application for the state or whether it's for a flood mitigation or a brick application, you're going to see these nine and maybe even more, um, sub application sections. So these are the things that, uh, you should be prepared when you're uh, working on an application to, to work on. And so we're only going to spot spotlight 2 of them, um, the scope of work. And the budget, the scope of work is the meat and potatoes of your application. You know, this is where you have to paint the picture to FEMA and the more, the better. You know, they're, they need they they don't have the institutional knowledge or the, the, the inner workings of, of the, pro the project that, you know, maybe a consultant has, or maybe the state has, or maybe your local, you know, floodplain manager has. So whatever you present to them has to be clear, almost like you're writing a story. So a detailed description, you know, talk about who's going to benefit or how are they impacted. Um, de describing how it's technically feasible is huge. And, and you do that in your BCA to make sure that your project is, you know, cost effective, but you want to provide a good scope that shows that it is feasible. Um, talk about what hazards are being mitigated and then what risks will remain because there probably will be a few, um, but hopefully not as many. You have to explain why this is the best alternative and 1 alternative that you can always give is do nothing. Um, continue to have damages and that that does sh we've we've seen shows uh, give some bearing to the projects um, doing nothing is technically an alternative and it's not a good alternative. And then how are you going to implement the project? So your scope of work has to be very detailed and. We, we see varying levels of scopes of work. Some are very detailed, some are not as much, and, and that's okay, but you really need to talk about the project and paint the picture for FEMA. So in doing that with your and, scope of work, go ahead, Katie. I'm, I'm just gonna interject here because we have a good um, set of questions that have been I'm, coming in. So yeah, just no wanted problem. to make I sure you know. I think two more, so I'm trying to fly through okay. here. Um, the next sub application spotlight we wanted to do is your budget. Um, obviously your other sub application sections are important, but if you can tie your budget directly to your scope of work, that also, that helps FEMA paint the picture as well as, you know, okay, the, the project is scoped out and now I understand what materials are going to be used and when they're going to be used, um, following your scope of work and following your schedule. I just wanted to briefly provide, um, a couple line item cost categories that you're going to see because your project. 
your budget does have to be line item based and you you lump your your costs into different categories such as your admin and legal expenses your architectural engineering your construction your demolition equipment rental relocation when you're doing your budget don't just do one line of you know fifty thousand dollars for construction do five thousand dollars for construction one five thousand for construction two you know really break it down because that's going to help fema understand what you're doing um, Ken mentioned pre-award costs. Those are eligible. Um, and as he mentioned, it's from the date the application period opens to when you get your award. Things that help you develop your application, do your benefit cost analysis, you have to identify on your application as a separate line item, a pre-award cost. Then you can have a contingency cost and management cost. Each of these is 5%. Contingency costs are exactly what they are, right? It takes a long time for FEMA to uh, go through a project and determine um, whether it's worthy of an award costs can go up or you may know that you know um, when you dig something up maybe you'll find an indian burial ground or something and that's going to cost an additional amount of money but you don't know what so what you'll do is you take your total project cost you take five percent of that that's your contingency cost it has to be a separate line item then what you do is you take the the total of the sum of those your project and your contingency and you add an additional five percent for your management cost now you have your total submission amount. So the fact that under BRIC, your management costs are 100% reimbursable, we, we strongly recommend putting in a management cost as a separate line item, separate cost category, given the nature of you know, the way of the world and timelines and um, increased cost of goods or labor, we always recommend doing contingency costs as well. 5% for each of those, because that you can really weigh on those. Um, when it comes to these national programs, there's not a lot of room for uh, budget increases. So if you have a line item in there for contingency, that can help um, given the, the increase of costs or unexpected costs. Um, Katie, this is my last slide. The last piece we'll talk about is what happens next. Um, can we mentioned that uh, sub applications are submitted and reviewed by the Interagency Has Mitigation Committee. We consolidate them into one state application. We submit it to FEMA and then FEMA makes the determination. FEMA just released their determinations for BRIC 2020 two weeks ago, um, and they fall into three buckets, not selected. That's pretty self-explanatory. There was just too much money uh, put in and not enough money to give out. It did not meet HMA requirements. It means that somewhere in the project, it wasn't ineligible. It, it didn't meet the grant standards, whether that was programmatically, it, it's not eligible or technically, maybe the project's not beneficial. Um, and then identify for further review. That's the one we wanna see. That's where FEMA has identified a project, meaning it has matched the requirements of the NOFO, Notice of Funding Opportunity, and the HMA guidance. It doesn't mean it's an award, but it means we're on the right track to getting to an award. Um, and so that is where we'll we will work with our FEMA Region 1 office um, to go over some maybe some environmental historic preservation things, or maybe they wanna look at your benefit cost analysis more. Maybe they wanna look at your scope a little bit more. Maybe they'll come to a site visit. So those are the things that happen and identify for further review. And Katie, I believe that is it. And now we can open up to questions, comments, discussion. So hopefully that was helpful. Um, we provided a, a background of all three uh, programs under the HMA umbrella that we administer. Um, we're not heroes, I know, but uh, we, we do our best um, administering those three programs and uh, we're, we're here to help you. So any questions, comments, you know, let us know. Yeah, we do have a few questions and thank you both. Honestly, that was a lot of information to provide. And so um, it's not time to take a breath yet, but you're, you did a lot in um, the amount of time you had. So um, for those of you that are entering questions, if you want to enter them to the host and presenter, the, they'll be able to see them as well. But we did get some that you probably can't see, Ken or Ian, so let me just read, read a couple off. Under community and capacity building, would there be a funding opportunity to fund the educational outreach program of the Connecticut Association of Floodplain Managers? I'm going to, Ken, I'll take that. I'll say maybe um, because we have seen before. Um, Funding available for uh, for training, whether that's under the partnership activity or whether that's under um, maybe the project scoping, if that's part of it. But I'm going to say maybe we, that's something that we would have to confirm with FEMA. It, po it possibly maybe may even be eligible under FMA too. Yeah. Right. 
Um, you might have seen this one because I think it was uh, sent to both me and you. But the building code is managed at the state level. What grants would this fund locally? Ken, do you want to talk building sorry, code? We're not building code experts. Yeah, can you repeat the question again? I'm sorry. Sure. Um, let me go back up. The building code is managed at the state level. What grants would this fund locally? And Doug also, um, who entered this question, had a few um, more comments as well. But and it might be the know. case of um, you know, there's so there's this category of updating building codes that's eligible. You know, what can a local community do? Um, under that category, well, like what would qualify as something that a local community could do to update their local codes that would qualify there? I'm, I'm guessing that's what he's getting at. So, I think we saw in uh, we saw something similar to this. I think it was in Hartford, wasn't it, Ian? And uh, yeah, what they chose to do was community, essentially a community outreach, and and educate the local community on current updates to the building code and things along those lines. Does that sound about right, Ian? Yeah, I and, there, and there's a, a helpful resource on FEMA's website, specifically the activities that you can do under that building code activity, under the community capacity building. Um, it includes outreach to ensure, you know, that your every structure in your community is meeting the, uh, the whatever the latest building code is, and and you can get funding to, to work on that outreach event or um if you're if you're looking to get an additional accreditation uh for your you know local building code that FEMA can assist in funding that if there's technical assistance or um maybe even hosting um like an, an outreach event again like we mentioned about uh the importance of building codes and how they relate to HMA but um FEMA has a very useful uh uh, resource about the specific activities that are available under that uh, building code um, activity. Okay. Um, John, I have one more in the chat that I'd like to ask them, and I know you have a couple that you've been seeing in the Q&A as well, but um, under BRIC, can an infrastructure project include engineering and design, or should it be construction only? Ken, I'll tell you, I'll, I'll start. Uh, it's both. Um, obviously having your engineering and design done, um, prior to your application or as a part of your application can assist in FEMA's review. They can look directly at your engineering and your design and look at the project more, but we have also seen under pre-disaster mitigation, uh, funding activities, uh, for engineering and design. Um, but that's really why FEMA, I think, opened up the new project scoping activity because you can get funding to do engineering design, start your permitting process, um, maybe do some mapping. That's all eligible act under project scoping. So it, FEMA, I think, is looking to, in my opinion, looking to get all that out of the way under a project scoping award and then take that and put it into a successful uh, shovel-ready application. But we have seen it in the past uh, be eligible. Uh, yeah, Ian, Ian's correct. And the, and the project scoping, the thing we have to keep in mind with that too is uh, it, it does fall under our uh, state set aside. Uh, Ian may have mentioned that. So it's we have to uh, just keep an eye on how many of those project scoping projects we we do push through. But ultimately, what FEMA would like to see is is a, a project that scopes out that we can then roll into the next um, you know round of funding, whether it may be with BRIC. Uh, in a lot of cases, we may be able to use that for an HMGP applications. It's designed to build a higher quality application that then can be moved forward in funding uh, and, you know, the construction piece, the kind of boots on the ground piece afterwards. Okay, John, I think you had one that came through the Q&A before we transition to Sean. Um, do you want to read that one? Yeah, sure. There was a question about um, the what you mentioned briefly, the small and impoverished um, can change sort of the the cost sharing calculation. So how how does the community determine whether they qualify for that? As a small and impoverished, what is, what's Ooh. the criteria? Truthfully, I can't remember. Can yeah, you, you remember? 
I've been, I saw that question come up and I've been trying to do a little research myself here. It's, you know, it's not something that we've dealt with yet here on our side yet, John. Um, I would say that I, what I would like to do is a little research on our side and get, get the best answer um, to that question uh, forwarded out maybe at a later date. But right now, I don't think we're prepared to answer that question. Okay, so we'll we'll table that one and maybe we can get an answer later in the webinar or we can follow up. Okay, and um, Ken and Ian, just a note that, that there is a comment that you can read um, from Doug Coulter who asked that building code question in the, um, as, as, as Sean is presenting, maybe you can look there and we can follow up if needed um, later in the webinar as well. Um, so we're going to transition to um, Sean Service. He's FEMA's um, grant. He's from FEMA's grants and analytics branch, and um, I'm just going to transition him to um, give him the controls. And hopefully, Sean, you'll be able to share your screen here in just a minute. Thank you all for listening to us. Yeah, and Katie, one more thing before Sean starts. Um, Sean's sure. excellent. So you're all. You're all. Uh, Sean is a great partner of ours, and so you're all in for a real treat. Um, Ken and I just want to reiterate that we have an open HMGP application. Um, we're accepting applications. FEMA is providing us with assistance in developing the applications. So you can use this as an opportunity to hear directly from FEMA about um, the type of project that you're looking to do, whether it's eligible, and they'll provide some guidance. And typically they haven't done that in the past and they're, they're offering us that opportunity. So um, if you've got you know, a smaller project, that may, you have a feeling may not, you know, make it nationally because these brick projects are, are really big um, multi-million dollar projects, you know, HMGP might be a good uh, source for you. Um, so reach out to us. It's on our website under, if you look up Demis and HMGP, all the information's right there. Yes, and, and, and one last thing, Katie, from, from me, uh, please everybody keep in mind that uh, we expect the notice of funding opportunity or the no photo come out for brick. Uh, sometime probably either at the end of August or early September. So uh, keep your eyes and ears peeled for that. You should see some notification from us at some point here. Um, following that NOFO, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll push out some guidance on, on dates and expectations that we have as far as getting applications in, reviewed and submitted to uh, FEMA uh, through the uh, January deadline. But thanks again, Katie and, and John for, for hosting us today. Uh, great job. Oh, yes, it was a gr great presentation. All right, Sean, you should be able to um, share your screen now. I know I see that you're unmuted. So let's um, try and bring up yeah. your slides. Hi, everybody. I'm Sean Servas, as uh, Katie and Ian mentioned. I'm from FEMA headquarters. Uh, some of you probably have bumped into me from the good old eGrants days when we were using the, the legacy system and for PDM and FMA, um, where I, I was working on the eGrant system. And now that we have a new system that Ian mentioned, FEMA Go, I've I've transitioned over to that, and I kind of do both of them now. Um, so give me a nod there if the uh, the screen share comes up. Yeah. We can okay. see it fine. It looks great. Great. Yeah. Uh, hello, Oklahoma. Oh, hello, Oklahoma. You, you do yeah, know you're this in is, Connecticut. Yeah, I should have. I should have. Uh, I, I should have prepared a test account in Connecticut just to make it more realistic. But uh, All right. um, yeah, this is away. just one of the. This is one of the coast or the test accounts that I use. Uh, since someone asked about the the definition of a small and impoverished community. Um, it's actually defined in 44 CFR 201.2 definitions. If you want to look up the real definition of a small and impoverished community, I think it's somewhere on the FEMA webpage too, but it, it has to meet all of these criteria. Uh, so it's pretty specific. That'll, I'll give you a shortcut if you want to look up the definition of small and impoverished community. Um, so uh, Ian mentioned it. Uh, FEMA Go, like, so we've talked about the BRIC program and we've talked about the FMA program. So how do we apply for these programs? Uh, how do we get our, our sub applications to the state and how does the state get their application to FEMA? Um, and that system is called FEMA Go. Um, and it was new last year. Um, 
I'm just going to go through like a real quick high level overview of what it is and how it works and what you're going to need to prepare for uh, looking forward to the open application season that's coming up uh, here in, in October. So to get to it, just go to go.fema.gov. Um, if I could type, can't type and look at the screen at the same time, apparently. So it's, yeah, just go.fema.gov and it'll take you right to it. And um, this is what it looks like. So you, you can only do two things here. If you've never used FEMA Go before, you're gonna need to create an account. And this is super easy. It's just like signing up for any other web page. Um, you know, you fill out some information, it sends you a confirmation email, and you have a FEMA Go account. That's step one. Like once you have your FEMA Go account, you won't be able to do anything until you get roles in the system. And that's where Ian and Ken are going to have to help you uh, or uh, an existing person within your, your organization. Um, so I'm going to jump back over here to the test environment because I don't want to use that. And I'll just log in here to see, you can see that it looks the same. And go back to this. And before, actually, before I get too far ahead of myself here, let me show you another another good place for resources. I like to just show people how to get to, to things instead of trying to send out links or whatever. Um, so just go to FEMA.gov, the FEMA webpage. And then you can, you can click on grant. That's right up here at the top. And we are hazard mitigation assistance grants. And my internet is lightning fast today. And this is, so you'll have all, all of our hazard mitigation assistance grants listed over here on the right side of the page. And uh, we'll just use brick for this example. I'll click on that. And this is where it'll tell you all about the brick grant program, like the notice of funding opportunity will be here. The, uh, the outreach seminars that uh, Ian mentioned are going to be posted here. Uh, this will be like this will be replaced by a summer 2021 engagement series, right? Or maybe it's already this link. I don't know. Um, all the, that kind of stuff is posted here. And then if you scroll down in this page, you'll find this link to FEMA grants outcome for hazard mitigation assistance grants. This is my web page. And there's there's a lot of good resources here for, and I could, I'll actually drop this in the chat just so people have it um, if you want a direct link. But um, it basically gives you a summary of the grants programs up here at the top. Um, we're going to update this with our webinars for 2021. Uh, we'll have a schedule for those. And uh, I'm, I'm going to be doing a, a series of webinars and I call it, I used to call it e-grants for beginners. And so I don't, it's hard to teach me new tricks sometimes. So I just call it FEMA Go for beginners. And these are really super high level uh, presentations, about 20 minutes long, like I'm going to do for you guys here. Uh, where I talk about FEMA Go, and then we just do question and answers, and it's pretty similar to what I want to do today. Um, and then if we scroll down just a little bit farther, we get to additional resources. And if you find this cryptic little link here, uh, it says training videos. I have six uh, different modules on YouTube, on the FEMA YouTube channel that takes you from the very beginning um, all the way through preparing a sub application and it goes hand in hand with the uh, sub applicant user manual. So if you if you go down here and find the sub application development user manual and download that 
and have it handy when you're you're watching these training videos, maybe on a separate screen. You should be well prepared to to submit a sub application using FEMA Go. Um, so uh, for this link, I'll post it here in the chat in a second if I can. Maybe I can get to it while I'm presenting. I'll I'll figure that out later. Um, but yeah, if you if you watch those videos and you have the the sub application development user manual, uh, like I said, you'll be you'll be in a really good position to to uh, get your sub application in uh, according to the Connecticut deadline. So they have plenty of time to review, and you can do your RFIs and all that kind of stuff. So let me go back over to the test environment, and uh, after so after you've logged in, this is what it will look like for a sub applicant. Uh, you you guys at the state level, of course, are, are applicants and your view is slightly different, uh, but for everyone else, you'll have this view and uh, you'll see the different funding opportunities that are open uh, for the period of time, whatever it is, those turn themselves on and off in FEMA Go. Here, they call these cards. They appear in this card over on the right. So. Um, if the if the brick funding cycle is open, unfortunately, the sub application sub applicants will also be able to see the start application button. This isn't for you. You want the sub application, right? This is for Ian and Ken. You get the the sub applicants don't need to use that. Um, so you would go to start a sub application. A sub application in our programs is like the like. Ken and Ian were mentioning before, it's program agnostic until it's attached to a grant application. So a project application is almost exactly the same information required for flood mitigation assistance, building resilient infrastructures and communities or the hazard mitigation grant program. So when you start a sub application, you'll only be presented with um, it asks you who you are and who you're applying to, um, and you, then you'll be presented with the different types of sub applications. So you have plan, project, and project scoping that are all available to the sub applicants. Um, this is this is just an artifact in the uh, the test environment um, right now. That's that's also for the state level. It shouldn't be appearing here, but for you you guys that are sub applicants, you'll have these three different uh, sub application types available to you. Plan and this you know, would be for a new plan or a plan update, um, projects and project scoping, and then you would select one of those and start your sub application. So that that is the the real short uh, introduction to like how do I get to one of these sub applications that I'm going to be applying for, and uh, to if you if you do log in and you don't have this link, like if you log in and you don't see anything on this page at all except for this search for your organization, that means you don't have any roles yet, and uh, those roles you can find in your profile. So you can see that um, my roles in this test account, I have the subrecipient authorized representative. If you don't have this role or the subrecipient member role, you're not going to be able to see that that sub application. And uh, it can be be done two different ways. Uh, an existing SAR can give it to you, or the guys there at the state can give you that SAR role. But you have to join your organization first. I cover all that very thoroughly in the videos uh, and in the user manual, so I'm not going to go go into it too deep um, today. But just be aware that if you've never used FEMA Go before, uh, like I said, signing up. For an account is super easy. It'll take you three minutes. It's just like signing up for any other web page. But then that task of joining your organization, uh, Ken mentioned Hartford. If you're going to join the city of Hartford organization, uh, you've got to find the person to do that for you. 
and you have to be assigned subrecipient roles before you'll be able to work on a sub application. So be prepared for that step. And I'll go back to my home page here. Sean, this All is right. Ian. I so, had a, just a very yeah. random question for everyone and for you. Um, yeah. You're uh, looking to sign up for, uh, join your organization. Um, who do you think is the head of your organization, whether they know it or not? Could you cover that? Ah, about the EBIT? Yes, <laughs> that's a, that's a very good point. I should have, I should have gone into that. Okay. So if you, if you've never signed up before, um, you're, you know, like, if you're, if your municipality has never signed up before, you're going to have two people in your, at your city or your county or whatever that are going to need to, to establish accounts in FEMA go. Um, the system for award management, I think everybody went, everybody's probably heard of that. You might not be familiar with it. That's a, a system that's owned by the general services administration, GSA, and they manage your DUNS numbers. So anyone that's ever received federal assistance already has an account in there and a DUNS number. And it's used to manage that. FEMA Go talks to that system. Um, so your electronic business point of contact and your government business point of contact in the system for award management are automatically recognized by FEMA Go as the default authorized organization representative. So that's usually somebody in your finance or maybe an admin um, that manages those DUNS numbers and you're going to need to chase that person down um, if you if you're both brand new to FEMA Go um, to have them give you the roles, or or to have them bring you into the organization. Uh, that thanks for thanks for mentioning that Ian. I, I haven't done these since last year, and I forgot an important step. Um, but yeah, you're. And if you if I go back to the home, or I'm already on the home page. If you search for your own Duns number here. Um, I, it should, this should work in a test environment. Oh, it, it loaded the results down here. <laughs> um, so it, it says your organization is already registered and it gives you a name. Uh, it should pull across both names, both the electronic business point of contact and the government business point of contact. Sometimes it's you know, that's an abbreviation, like a first initial or something like that, but you should be able to find uh, who you're looking for um, using this search feature if uh, if you need to, or you can look it up in SAM.gov. Um, so that's kind of a tip on that. And uh, I have a related question. Um, yep. if, let's say you haven't um, established that role or you're not in that system. So how would you do that from from FEMA Go? Could you just assign yourself as the the lead for the organization, or what what does that look like? If you're, you mean if you if you do not have an account with the system for award management? Yeah, if I let's say it's it's a, it's a, a nonprofit that's uh, going after FEMA funding for the first time, for instance. Uh, that so that whole process would be done in the system for award management. They would have to. Um, go through the whole process of um, establishing an account in the system for award management and um, getting a DUNS number, um, being recognized as a, an active entity by uh, by GSA. That that's a that's a whole process in an under, in an unto itself, and I've only seen that I. Th think one time uh, where someone did not have a DUNS number. So it's not it's not unheard of, but it's almost unheard of that uh, that a, a potential sub recipient or sub applicant would not have a DUNS number. I'm, I'm sure it could happen, uh, but it, it's going to be by far the exception rather than the rule. OK, thanks. So, yeah, if it's, <laughs> I should, it's going to be so infrequent, I should probably tell people just to call me <laughs> the, if, they're, if they run into that. Um, the, uh, and there, there are actually instructions on here. Uh, if you go to that web page that I'm going to put in the chat, um, 
in additional resources. Objects of application. Yeah, it's not it's not, not on this page. It's on a we could get you a link for that. There are instructions about how to do that if you search uh, FEMA Gov for um, how to navigate SAM.gov in the organization management um, um, organization and suborganization user manual management user manual. I thought they were on this. I'm going to have to make sure that's updated on on my web page, so it's kind of one stop shopping. Um, and Sean, if you want to send me the links after um, the webinar too, we can get that out to all the registrants along with the oh. slides and the um, and the that's a great idea. recording. So. Yeah. yeah, that's a good idea. I'll do that. Um, all right, so where was I? Uh, after you've created your sub application, um, they'll appear here in this, what they call these cards that'll they'll appear here where you can continue working on them or you can go up here and click on your grants and you'll have a list of everything. Uh, I should point out there's, since this is a new system, it's pretty bare bones functionality right now. One of the things that you can't do is after you create a sub application, you can't delete it. So if you create one, you're stuck with it. So a, a lot of, a lot of people, the first thing they did when the new system came online, they were like, I want to, you know, I want to see what this thing looks like. And they went and started a sub application thinking, oh, I'll just delete it later. And uh, they couldn't delete it. So <laughs> in the test, in the test environment, and also in production, we have a lot of uh, empty sub applications where someone has changed the title to something like do not use because um, they've, uh, they've created a sub application and they can't delete it. Uh, so think twice before you create a sub application just for fun, uh, but you can rename them if you do create a couple of test copies or you want to keep one as a kind of your boilerplate if you're going to be pursuing multiple funding programs. Um, so another thing that you'll see here in your list of sub applications is the the status. Um, you can see that this one in, in my test environment, again, has been approved by the recipient. Hasn't been approved by FEMA, but it's been approved by the recipient. Uh, this one has only been submitted to the recipient, so I can't work on it anymore because I've already submitted, submitted it to Connecticut. Um, but if it's pending submission, if I haven't submitted it yet, I can keep working on it. I can continue the sub-application. So I'm going to I'm going to go ahead and continue the sub application. And, and while that's loading, I want everyone on the webinar to know that when you submit your, your sub application, have no fear. You're not submitting it to FEMA yet. You're just submitting it to Connecticut and we now it's now in our hands. So um, it hasn't gone to FEMA yet. We had a lot of questions last year that, oh, you know, if I submit this, is it going right to FEMA? Nope, it's coming right to us. We are the recipients. Um, and so, don't, you know, there's still time. We can release it back to you. Can or on maybe in your last five minutes, you can see what that looks like. But um, we will release yeah. it back to you if you have any issues with your application or if you remembered something. It didn't go to FEMA yet. Don't worry. I just wanted to make that point. Thank you, Sean, for showing this. Right, and the and the system uh, they they tried to make that descriptive here uh, when it does change that sat uh, status to submitted to recipient, but that's a good good thing to point out. I've I've heard of other people or other, in other states. I've heard people that were uh, equally, um, you know, like I better call before I press this button because <laughs> I don't want to send this straight to FEMA. Uh, and then some people were under the misconception that they could. They were eligible grant applicants to the to uh, FEMA directly, and of course, uh, that's not true for uh, for your local municipalities. They're sub recipients to the state. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and continue working on this sub application. And it, uh, Ian had a slide of this. Uh, the different sections of a sub application there. If you're familiar with the old e grant system, uh, this will look very familiar to you. All the uh, 
all the sections of the sub application are here on the left. They call this the left navigation panel. Um, and it, you can scroll all the way through them and click on them individually individually to jump to whichever one you're interested in, or you can just, you can just scroll down um, and keep hitting the continue button um, to go through all the, the sections one by one. Uh, this is a project sub application, so it's the most complex type of sub application. It has the most sections of it, of any of them in the uh, this left left side navigation. Um, a planning sub application will be the the least complicated because a plan sub application won't have a cost effectiveness section. It won't have any EHP environmental historic preservation review information and it won't have any kind of location um, a, a project scoping sub application will not have this location section either uh, but it will have the other ones and in some cases project scoping is not applicable for cost effectiveness but I'm going to have to Double check what's in the uh, 2021 notice of funding opportunity around that. Um, but yeah, don't don't panic and with project scoping and and uh, you're doing your BCA. I think I'll, I'll have to double check the guidance, but I'm pretty sure that's not applicable for uh, um, project scoping unless there, yeah, there's some something really funny going on. Don't quote me. Look at the look at the 2021 funding <laughs> notice of funding opportunity when that's available. Um, so, yeah, this is pretty straightforward. Uh, I'm not going to click on each one of these. You go, you know, you work through the sections here, uh, fill out the information. One thing that that Ian mentioned um, was about your your budget section, and what what I've heard. Um, and Ian, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, what they're looking for in at the well, I, I'll tell you what Ian. I'll, I'll put it this way. I know what they're looking for at, on the FEMA end. And if Ian, if you're looking for something different, Ken, if you're looking for something different, please, please correct me. Um, but they would like people to lump their things into the different budget object classes on the FEMA side. Um, so if you do have um, construction as one of your items on the FEMA side, that's okay um, to put your construction cost in there. And then if you have something that's very complex, um, a, a detailed breakdown of your budget where you know a construction budget may be extremely complex. You know you might have pages of information um, for your construction budget. Uh, that would be a great attachment. Um, I I did see some people doing some of those very large complex projects uh, that that Ian mentioned, trying to enter all of that information uh, as line items. You know hundreds of different items into the uh, their budget section and the system didn't handle that very well. So I would I would recommend that you you try to keep your your cost items um, trimmed down. And if if you want to attach a very detailed budget, that would uh, budget breakdown. That would be a great attachment. Hey Sean, that is fantastic to hear, and I'm very glad that you mentioned that um, for everyone on on the. Uh, on the webinar today because um, I was worried we were worried last year with the, you know the brand new rollout of 2020 that if we didn't have you know construction uh, costs identified by you know what your whatever mm -hmm. it was in in FEMA go that you know it wouldn't have a good shot but if you're saying that you can have if you total up you know if you've got 40 pieces of construction um, elements to your budget if you can total them all up under one construction line item and then detail it in an attached budget, that's great. I know eGrants, we've seen, you know, the larger breakdown. Um, mm -hmm. So I was kind of bringing that into the 2020, but I'm so happy that you were, that you said that and kind of, I'm happy that you said the system can't handle it because then that, <laughs> that doesn't make it anybody's fault, but the system. 
Yeah, it and it it doesn't. Uh, you know, FEMA wants to know that you're that you're keeping track of that, right? But the for the FEMA reviewer, I'm not a FEMA reviewer, so I'm putting words in their mouth, but they're not interested in seeing that in in this part of this and you know detailed to that level uh where where this section of the sub application becomes important is when the grants management specialists are reviewing it for award and th let me tell you they are not interested in that i mean they want to see it as an attachment but they're uh, they're not interested they're interested in these budget budget object classes that i pointed out before um this breakdown. They're, That's great. They're not going to review it any deeper than that. Um, That's great. Everyone heard the it from the horse's mouth. Yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> so, yeah, we, um, and I, I have seen the system just uh, choke if you, if you try to get carried away entering too many, um, too many line items in here. Um, I can, I can go on for quite a while about the budget section as well as most of the other sections so I'll I'll just wrap that up there. Uh, and Sean, we're, one thing we're, I the, uh, we're just I just need to interject because we're at the, the 230 mark when John um, was going to start presenting about benefit cost analysis. So okay. if you do have um, oh. some a couple of final highlights that would be great. Yep. Two hey, I'll just mention two more things. Um, if you're a subrecipient Look in the notice of funding opportunity for 2021 and find out what we're, what we're doing for management costs for the subrecipient this year. And for uh, last year for subrecipients, management costs um, were a line item in your budget. And there is a there is a, a cost bucket for that in your sub application budget section. So for subrecipient management costs last year, I'm assuming it'll be the same this year um those those were your five percent was put here in the budget section and then ian mentioned um what does a um a review look like um basically when you're at your grants or a uh, or a request for more information um it would it would just say it would just become pending submission again if you had a uh, if you had a sub application that was in submitted to recipient status and Ian sends it back to you, it'll change to pending submission status and you'll be able to work on it again. Um, but while it's been submitted to him, you won't be able to work on it. So that's the only difference that you'll see is it'll change from the status of submitted to recipient back to pending submission. And then you'll have to go through the electronic signatures again and send it back up to the state. So thank you very much, everyone. Please join me for the uh, the FEMA Go for Beginners if you kind of want to hear some more of this spiel again uh, later in the summer. And I look forward to seeing you guys all down the road. Hey, Sean, just, this is Ken. Just a quick, quick question. Uh, two quick mm -hmm. questions, sorry. I know we're on a, a time frame here. Um, did I notice that uh, it was, it was, calculating the management costs as it as it went along with the budget line items did you say that no it you that's a manual calculation okay okay um, if if you submit a you know if your total budget is a hundred dollars then your total sub application costs are going to be 105 dollars right. according to last okay. year's rules uh to account for that five percent sub recipient management cost and did they have has FEMA go figured out a way to create a PDF of the application uh, this year? Only, um, oh. only after the sub application is submitted to FEMA, then you can export uh, an entire PDF. But uh, up until uh, it's submitted to FEMA, you have to do that section by section. They have not fixed that. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Sean. That was re really helpful information to get people started and and have them navigate um, some of these resources. The, if you have links to anything that you wanted to share, um, like I said, feel free to send them to me, and I can distribute them to the re registrants. The videos and the user manuals you reference. Obviously, you can't go over everything today in a half an hour, but it sounds like those would be great resources for people. Um, 
yeah, to be following up with and, and looking at and seeing if they have additional questions. And it sounds like you have more information that's going to be coming um, in some form of uh, event or webinar later in the summer, too. Yep, you bet. Great. Thanks a lot, All everybody. Right. So we're going to transition to John Rudolph. Um, he and Keisha Isaac Rickards are both um, engineers in FEMA Region 1, and um, I've given you, John, the, the uh, privileges to share your screen, so you can do that. We, we're going to spend the last, um, hopefully, 20 minutes uh, talking about BCA, and um, John, I see that you've unmuted yourself, so... We'll go for it, and I know that's not a lot of time to go into a really um, complex topic, but it sounds like you're going to be having um, a, a, some form of workshop or outreach in the next um, couple months too, so people can listen to that if they don't get everything they need today. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, can you see the screen that I'm showing right now? FEMA benefit cost analysis slide one. No, we don't. We don't see any slides. Um, Ian has your slides, so. Ian, do you want to bring them up and? Yeah, I can do that for you, John. Okay, thanks, Ian. I can't hear John very well either. Um, sorry for the technical oh, that's difficulties, but uh, I've been deployed to Windsor JFO and don't have my normal equipment, so I'm running just off a laptop now. But. Um, that's okay. right. We have your slides up now. Can you see them? Okay. Yep. Great. Okay. Great. Um, basically, that's the title. This is BCA Basics. It's an introduction to benefit cost analysis. Next slide, please. Um, what is a benefit cost analysis? A benefit cost analysis is the process of quantifying the benefits of a mitigation action and comparing it to its costs. Next slide. I'm going to go really, really quick. Um, I was asked before this presentation, when do you require a BCA? Basically, anything that's hazard mitigation related. Uh, 404 projects, which is uh, hazard mitigation assistance not associated with a with damages that were caused during a disaster and public assistance 406 projects, which are projects that are basically um, you've had damage and during the reconstruction of that damage, you want to make it better and less susceptible to future damage, mitigating future damages. Next slide. Okay, when do you not need a BCA? When you're doing a hazard mitigation plan, um, project scoping activities, management costs are not included in the BCA, technical assistance, and as you can see on the bottom, 5% initiative projects for HMGP is highlighted and starred. Why is that? Because they do require a BCA. What they don't require is a traditional BCA. Next slide. Um, this is why I highlighted it. While a tr traditional BCA is not required, they do require that they are cost effective. You do this through a narrative analysis supporting the effectiveness of the proposed mitigation action. You must quantify the benefits in the analysis. What that means is you have to come up with numbers. You don't have to actually run a BCA, but you have to have quantities of costs in your narrative showing that it is going to be cost effective. Um, we can get into what cost effectiveness is in a second, but the 5% initiative projects are there because there are some projects that it's difficult to conduct a traditional BCA. You don't have past damages, you don't have a loss of service, but you can still prove quantitatively that, sorry, um, that the BCA is cost effective. Um, what are some examples of when you when you can do this is adopting and enforcing the latest IVC or IRC, uh, improving building code effectiveness and grading schedule, your BCEGS score, upgrading existing code to incorporate disaster resistant code provisions, 
and integrating flood resistant elements of building code into floodplain management or ordinances. You could see that this would be hard to come up with actual damages or a loss of service. We'll get into that in a few minutes, but um, that's why they're 5% initiative and you just have to come up with a narrative analysis versus an actual benefit cost analysis. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, for traditional BCAs, what kind of project types generally fall under these mitigation actions? You, we have structure elevations, mitigation reconstruction, which is when you're constructing something and you're, you're reconstructing something that wasn't necessarily damaged during a declared disaster. But while you're reconstructing it, you're going to be adding mitigation to it. Uh, dry flood proofing. Um, dry flood proofing versus wet flood proofing is wet flood proofing means that you want something to be able to get wet and not uh, suffer damages from getting wet. Dry flood proofing is when you're preventing something from getting wet, such as flood doors, flood gates. Um, Anything that's going to prevent something from getting wet, that's dry flood proofing. Generators, yes, they are project types. Uh, localized flood risk reduction projects, non-localized flood risk, risk reduction projects. Structural retrofitting of existing buildings, which is um, usually for earthquakes. Um, there are specific earthquake things specific earthquake mitigation actions and they're used to prevent further more damage than you could get by not uh, retrofitting the structure. Non-structural retrofitting of existing buildings and facilities, safe room construction generally isn't uh, something we do here in Region 1 very often, wind retrofits, infrastructure retrofits, soil stabilization, wildfire mis mitigation, yes, miscellaneous and other. If it's not on this list, you can still um, use it as a mitigation action, but you have to show how the mitigation action will reduce the costs. Um, property acquisition, oh, okay. Pre-calculated benefits. Sorry, uh, sorry, John, I jumped ahead. That's okay. <laughs> that's not a problem because that's um, what we were getting into. Acquisitions and elevations in special flood hazard areas have pre-calculated benefits. I'm not gonna get into numbers right now. Residential hurricane wind, in non-residential hurricane wind retrofits, individual tornado safe rooms, hazard mitigation grant program post wildfire. Um, Usually you'd see that out west. I don't think we have all that much wildfire danger here in the northeast. Let's go to the next one, Ian, please. For everyone's awareness, we have used pre-calculated benefits here in Connecticut for um, acquisitions and elevations. Ken and I can work with you all um, to come up with those numbers because it does vary a little bit based off of the county that you're in. FEMA uses um, a, a multiplier um, from a, a standard I guess 2013 or 2015 uh, number for you know the average cost of an elevation or an acquisition, and then there's a multiplier added onto it depending on uh, uh, the county that you live in. So um, if you're interested in doing an acquisition or an elevation um, and using your pre-calculated benefits, so you don't have to do a BCA, um, we can uh, we can work with you on that. So I'm glad that John uh, highlighted that here. Another thing about the pre-calculated benefits, one advantage to using pre-calculated benefits is aggregation of benefits. Uh, for example, say you have one structure within a group of structures in a localized area that is significantly less value than the um, pre-calculated benefits for each structure is, because what we do is we take the average of all the structures. Say you have 10 structures in your application, um, you get 10 times the pre-calculated benefits. So if you have one structure that's really much less, or you have a group of structures that are less 
than the pre-calculated benefit and you have one structure that is significantly more, that one structure that's significantly more would be um, eligible under the program as being cost effective because of the aggregation of the total of the benefits. Next slide, please. What is a BCR? A BCR is the ratio of the benefits over the costs. And this is where it gets tricky. Next slide, please. What is a benefit? A benefit is realized when a past or we do allow expected damages are avoided in the future. How do you calculate that? You take the before mitigation damages and the after mitigation damages. One note, um, there are only two project types that have no after mitigation damages. Every project type will have something called residual damages, which is your after mitigation damages. Um, I think I get into that a little later, but um, let's move on to costs. Costs in the BCA are all costs that will be incurred during the design and construction of the proposed mitigation action. In other words, all your engineering that goes into preparing uh, the plans, that is a cost. It's not just the construction costs. The only costs that are not included in calculating the BCA are the management costs. That is, um, that's still reimbursed by FEMA under the grant program, but is not calculated in your BCA. That is pretty much the only cost that doesn't get considered when you're doing a benefit cost analysis. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, thank you, John, for mentioning that because we have, uh, for anyone that's interested in doing a project scoping award where you'll be, you know, working with an engineer to do some design or uh, engineering or um, surveying or, or what, what have you for a future shovel ready project. If you get to that future shovel ready project and you also get an award, you have to include what was done under the project scoping um, as part of the costs, no matter if it's a year or two down the road, um, because it is still part of the cost of that overall project. Am I, am I correct in that, John? Yes, you are. And thank you for mentioning right. that. That will make it a lot easier for anybody um, in their BCA because we do look back under those scoping costs if um, during our reviews. So a lot of times they are omitted and we do have to add them later. And unfortunately, they sometimes um, end up in a project becoming not cost effective. Uh, next slide. Okay, um, your damages. There are two types of damages before and after mitigation. Um, in the software, you will see something called um, service loss and then optional damages. Loss of service is what is the cost that FEMA has predetermined what a utility out it, it's used for utilities and closures of road generally. Um, it's also used for um, loss of a critical facilities function. So how is that calculated? FEMA has gone out to um, subject matter experts and hired uh, outside firms to calculate what, what is the value that can be attributed to a day's loss of service per customer. Um, customers are the people in a house. So if a person in a home can't have electric service, FEMA has a predetermined value for that. If they can't have potable water service, FEMA has a predetermined value for that. If they can't have um, sanitary sewer service, same idea. They've also done this for the closure of roads. Uh, the closure of roads is based on the distance for a detour and the amount of time that detour will take. Um, the time for the detour includes both commercial and private um, costs. So it's an average. 
Um, the value for that's the value for the time for the closure of the road. There's two there's two parts to the closure of a road: the value of the time and the distance of the detour. The distance of the detour is based on the GSA value for um, for vehicle mileage. Um, that should not be changed in the software unless you're doing a loss of service for a different year. Um, I won't get too deep into that because I am running late as it is. Uh, physical damages. As I mentioned before, there's two types of damages. There's the loss of service damages and there's physical damages. Say, um, uh, for example, a bridge gets damaged and you repaired the bridge and it was out for four days. So you had the closure of the road for four days and you had the repair costs. You can also have response costs. Like, let's say when you close that road for four days, you had to post a police patrol there. You had an officer on each side of the bridge, you know, for how many days. That's another cost that would go in optional damages. Um, I can go on and on about this, and I will go into more detail in the BCA class, but I am running short on time. Next slide, please. Uh, before mitigation damages in the BCA must be mitigated by the proposed mitigation action. What does that mean? That means I, I like to use this as an example. Uh, one of the projects that I reviewed at one time, the before mitigation damages were extremely well documented. Um, the mitigation action, there were two mitigation actions being sought. One was to raise manhole covers in a floodplain, and the other part was to provide a generator for the pump station for the sanitary sewer. The damages, on the other hand, were based on the road closure. Extremely well documented. They had the chief of police sign off that the road was closed for X many, you know, X number of days. Um, on each event. Unfortunately, a generator and raising manhole covers will not mitigate from the road flooding. Um, what, what that's saying is that the loss of service really had nothing to do with the proposed mitigation action. Um, yes, you were providing mitigation by providing a generator and raising the manhole covers, but your loss of service would not be mitigated by that action. What they would need to show in the case of that uh, application would be how much extra pumping did they have because the water rose to a specific level out in that field. They had extra pumping due to um, water entering the system, and that is why you want to raise the manhole. Um, for the generator, you would have to show how much outage you had in electricity. And in this project, you could have used both together, but they did not. Um, one thing I would like to add is everybody gets hung up on recurrence intervals. Don't calculate your recurrence intervals. I know the software asks for it, but make sure you have at least three damaging events. Once you know three damaging events, the software will calculate the recurrence interval for you. Um, that's another thing that I see quite often is that the recurrence interval used has nothing to do with the mitigation action proposed. Um, just because you had a hundred year storm doesn't mean that's why the road closed. So before you do anything in researching recurrence intervals, just get three damage events, put them in the software. If that doesn't work, then try the recurrence intervals. It's gonna save you a lot of time and effort and usually ends up being more conservative than, find, than calculating the recurrence intervals anyway. Okay, next slide. I don't have much time left. <laughs> uh, historic damages, as I just said, it is not necessary necessary to determine the recurrence interval. List as many, don't stop with three. I know everybody says, oh, the software will do it as three. 
don't go back as far as you possibly can. Uh, I recommend keeping really good uh, records. And if you can't, uh, try to research as much as you can as far back as to the age of the structure. Uh, I'll get, I can get more into that in a, in a uh, class, but I just don't have time here. Uh, if one more, if more than one event has occurred in a single year, so say, I probably shouldn't say this, but let's say you're applying for a generator and you have five outages in a year. You have two choices. You can either figure out what the damages are of a single event, and I would pick the greatest event and enter that with a recurrence interval, or the better choice is take all of the damages for that year, all five events, sum them together, enter them in the software with an unknown recurrence interval. As a single event in, let's say you had five outages in 2019, sum them all together, show me all of the outage data that you have. You can usually get that from a utility company. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, professional expected damages. That is also a viable option. It is very hard to do. If historic damage amounts are unknown, engineering calculations you use to determine the expected damages from hazard events. Yes, this is documentation from an engineer signed by an engineer, but it is not the engineer's opinion that we're looking for. We are looking for calculations supporting his expected events. Um, some of the ways to do this are, um, let's say you have a seawall, what are the forces acting on the seawall? What are the resistive forces of the seawall? Um, at different recurrence intervals, because now you have to do a couple of them. Um, this should really only be used for something that's fairly new and you don't have past damage events. Um, I don't generally see many of these having the supporting documentation required. It's a lot of work to um, determine professional expected damages. And like I said, it's a lot more than just, it's a lot more than just um, an engineer signing that he feels that he's, that we expect these damages at this recurrence. Okay, next slide, please. After mitigation damages, as I said earlier, all mitigation actions will have res residual damages. Um, the only two mitigation actions that have no after mitigation damages are acquisitions and relocations. An acquisition is when you purchase a piece of property and the building on it and destroy it. It can't have any more uh, damages. Also a relocation, you must relocate it out of the special flood hazard area. So it's not going to have any more damages. Those are the only two that are acceptable to have no after mitigation damages. And I have sent to the um, to Katie, um, two documents. One is table four, a summary of proposed guidance to address problem statement four. And I put that on one sheet and I've also given you the reference to that. That was one of the documents produced during the benefit cost analysis re-engineering for the DFA module in 2009. And they had realized that people were having a hard time um, estimating what after mitigation damages are and for the different types of projects you can see in there what to use for your after mitigation damages. Um, next slide please. And John we'll be sure to um, get those out to the registrants as well um, just so that pe pe it's now three o'clock and so for whoever wants to stay on to continue um, listening to the end of your presentation please please do we'll keep this open. Um, we only have one question so far, so I'm just going to ask that in case that participant needs to jump off 
because I think it's a pretty quick answer. How do interested okay. parties get access to predetermined cost data? It's on the FEMA website, actually. If you go to FEMA.gov, grants, guidance tools, benefit cost analysis, there will be a page there that will lead you to predetermined benefits. Um, I don't just know. So you know just, yeah, just so you know, I think Ian mentioned this before. There is there there is a predetermined predetermined cost benefit, but there also is a multiplier that we use in Connecticut to actually help boost that number. Um, so it, it, please contact us if, if if that's something you're interested in. Okay, okay. And, thank you. And, and John, do you um, want to mention the class too in case people are having to jump off? I see participants are having to leave. But if yeah, I know we're having a class come up. I believe it's August 9th in Connecticut. Um, yeah, we're going to do um, this is Ian. We're going to do a two day more extended BCA class with John and some folks from from FEMA region one. Um, it'll be virtual, but it'll be two uh, four hour sessions. And so if you're interested in the BCA benefit cost analysis module and learning more. Um, it'll be much more in depth. This was, you know, and kind of a nice ice tip of the iceberg, but, um, you know, John is an expert in this and uh, we defer to him a lot on this stuff. And there's, there's so much about the BCA that is so critical to understanding and, um, it is a make or break on your application. And so, um, we would highly recommend, you know, attending that class. Um, and we will, we'll, we'll send some information out. Uh, through our, you know, various channels, including circa about uh, the class as it gets uh, closer. Great. Okay. Um, I pretty much went through the meat of what I wanted to go through today. If you want to get the toolkit, there's the uh, address right there. You go to FEMA.gov. You could even just go to the internet and search for uh, FEMA BCA and find this. Um, this is where you will get it. I would. I like running it on the local. You can also run it off of um, Excel online. Um, I guess next slide, please. And I would, if you need more help, this is very important. As you're running the BCA, you're going to see this little icon with the uh, letter I in it. Just about Everything you ever need to know about running a BCA is there except the uh, documentation required. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to the BC helpline. Uh, there's their phone number and address. You can also get that off of the FEMA, the main FEMA DHS Gov website and um, contact Ian. Ian can contact us and we can help you out with it. Ian or um, Ken from the uh, state of Connecticut, since we're working with the state of Connecticut. Next slide, please. I think that's it, John. Um, geez, that's I thought I had. I had contacts on it. Yeah, oh. you know what? I didn't go two more slides, Ian. Yep, uh, that's me. That's my email address at FEMA. Keish Isaac Ricketts is also a general engineer. You haven't heard with, from her yet because I haven't stopped talking. <laughs> but uh, Keisha was instrumental in helping uh, prepare this um, public service announcement for you. And I would like to thank her for all her help. And yep. that will be it for today. Thanks so much, John. Wow, that, that was a lot of information from all of you um, as presenters. So really, it was a wonderful um, set of information to give to people. And it sounds like we're going to be um, having a lot of great information to follow up even by email as resources and even a class for people to attend um, and learn more. So this is all wonderful. Thank you for attending as well today. Um, I'll be sharing the slides and the webinar recording and some of these links and additional resources from the speakers um, following today's presentation, probably later in the week. So I appreciate um, everyone's participation and attendance and thanks. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, Katie. Thank you, Katie.